Hello, hello, welcome back to another episode of The Casual Criminalist. I am your host, Simon. What happens here is, uh, oh, this is a, a script from Kevin. I don't think Kevin's ever written for this channel before, but he did a piece for me and he does uh, pieces for another channel slash podcast that I do called Decoding the Unknown. Now is an organic time for a plug for that channel. Uh, basically, I haven't prepared this at all. <laughs> This is just totally off the cuff, but it's a channel where we look at all sorts of mysterious things. Like there was a book that basically predicted a ton of stuff about the sinking of the Titanic, a, a fiction book written like 20 years before the Titanic sunk. And it's like eerie. Obviously I'm a fairly skeptical person. I'm like, yeah, it's all just coincidence, but it's still crazy. We look at stuff like that and uh, yeah, it's a fun channel. Kevin, who wrote today's Casual Criminalist, has written a few things for Decoding the Unknown. And he was like, Simon, I'd love to have a, t a crack at Cash Crim. And I'm like, my dude, let's go. So Kevin wrote this. Ted Conrad, 52 years is America's most wanted. That's quite a run, isn't it? If you're new here, uh, I've never read this before. This is what we call a cold read. We explore it together. I uh, I read it for a first time. The other, <laughs> we recently did one about this guy who murdered basically 300 children. And everyone's like, Simon starts this episode so chipper because he has absolutely no idea what's coming. And then about an hour later, I'm like, oh my God. People are f horrible. <laughs> and that was uh, that was my day. That was great. I'm starting this one real chipper. I get the feeling if he's 52 years as America's most wanted, he's probably not a great guy, is he? Osama bin Laden was America's most wanted. He wasn't a great guy. Then he got shot, which was nice. Let's go. And his body thrown in the ocean. Ah, yes. <laughs> it's like that song uh, from The Lonely Island. That was, ah, love it. Let's go. Everybody knows that crime doesn't pay. Yeah, it does. Crime does pay, otherwise there'd be no crime. Who, who's that quote from? Like, crime doesn't pay. Crime does pay. If it, did, if it didn't, there'd be no crime. Don't remember, but I like it. Except for Simon, exactly, who will gleefully tell you at great length the extent to which crime does pay. <laughs> I don't read these before, I promise. And for Theodore Conrad, that couldn't be more true. Should the old accident be changed to crime doesn't pay unless you're really good at it or only up against inept small town police department, that's probably more accurate, but it unfortunately doesn't apply here. Ted committed a brazen crime to which he confessed beforehand, and it wasn't just some bumbling detectives trying to track him down. Ted Conrad spent 52 years being hunted by the FBI, the US Marshals, and anyone who owned a television. This is quite impressive. I mean, normally when you're like, you're, you know, it's like you commit some small robbery there's the, and you just go on the run and that's it. Cause like no one cares. Like the FBI aren't getting involved, <laughs> but the U S marshals, there's that TV, any TV show with the FBI and the U S marshals, you're like, you know, it's serious. They're the big guns. So what could Ted have done to wind up as the suspect, as the subject of such an intense search by law enforcement? Was he a serial killer, a child molester, a ch chronic jaywalker? Did I tell the story I got in trouble for jaywalking? <laughs> I was in Atlanta. My aunt lives in Atlanta and uh, I was just crossing the street like, like a normal person would. And a policeman comes up to me and he's like, uh, you got to cross at the crossing. And I'm like, really? <laughs> it's like, yes, foreigner to the crossing. And I'm like, okay, I'm sorry. Luckily for Simon, there will be no rotting carcasses or heads stuffed inside, inside inside Hello Kitty dolls today. No, today is just a good old-fashioned heist. Ah. Oh. I know, I know everyone loves the murder ones, because as I've said, you're all sickos, but ah. Uh. Like, I'm feeling a heist story today. I'm feeling it. I'm okay with the lower views. Let's heist! Let's do it. <laughs> yeah! However, the title I gave this is clearly clickbaity enough that it won't hurt your viewership too much. Well, it will now, Kevin. Everyone's clicking off. Or like, well, uh, what else do I have in my podcast app? Maybe there's something about murder. Preferably the murder of children. You sickos. Who was Ted Conrad? Ted Conrad was just an ordinary kid born in Denver, Colorado. While his parents did divorce when he was at an early age, there's no evidence that he was ever abused or led any sort of troubled life, probably why he didn't end up putting someone's face inside a doll. Uh, he, was pro he was born in 1949, so early reporting would have referred to him as coming from a broken home, but that doesn't seem to have any sort of damaging impact of him, on him. After the divorce, Conrad's mother took Ted and his sister and moved to Lakewood, Ohio. Rather than a tragic upbringing, leaving him an isolated loan 
Henry was a popular kid in school. He was well liked enough to be elected the stu- to the student council. Elections for which everyone knows always has just been a popularity contest having nothing to do with the student's capability or proposed agenda. Well, it does have a do to do with their uh, social capability, doesn't it? It's always like you just got that position because you're well liked. Well, it's like yeah, but I'm well liked, aren't I? And are you? No, exactly. Thank you very much. Uh, just like real elections. <laughs> Exactly. Being well liked is important in life. <laughs> well liked people are. Well, they're well liked, aren't they? He's also reported as being very bright, with an IQ of 135. I'm not sure what that would translate when adjusted for inflation, but I'm not impressed. Ted graduated high school in 1967 and spent a semester at New England College, where his father was an assistant professor of political science. He then dropped out and went to community college back in Cleveland. As a side note, when researching this story, I found an article from a Cleveland publication from about 2008 about Conrad skipping his 40th year reunion for his high school class. I understand slow news dates happen, and this was a major unsolved story, especially for the people of Cleveland, but I can't possibly think of something less surprising or newsworthy. 24-hour news coverage really has lowered the bar. All of this information is mostly trivial, however. Aside from showing that Ted Conrad did not have the same sort of uh, abusive, neglectful, or alienated childhood as your average criminal, it doesn't really tell you who he is. A report from the U.S. Marshal Service tells us, in surprisingly flattering and almost poetic terms, who he was as a person. To all appearances, Conrad was that all-American boy whose character was not questioned and seemed to be a model of responsibility during a turbulent time. Don't even met him. This is who Conrad was, the model of responsibility. And so, when he began working as a teller at Society National Bank headquarters in 1969, it's no wonder that he was given a position that they only gave to trusted employees, working inside the bank vault to package the money to be sent to other Society National Bank branches around the city. This is one of those things It's like, yeah, just he's well liked, looks trustworthy. Who's, um, does that, it's like, you know, oh, this isn't my joke and I can't remember who tells it. It's like a stand up joke. Um, I always feel bad about that because I'm like, you should credit the person who comes up with a joke. But it's like, if the guy, if you're on a plane and like the most competent pilot in the world comes on, but he's kind of a bit fat and he's like bumbling and he looks a mess and he's got like a stain on his jacket, like that's the guy flying the plane. But then, you know, Brad Pitt could come in wearing like a a, a pilot's uniform, <laughs> never having flown a plane before. And you'd be like, well, you know, he looks like he could fly this plane real well, <laughs> which is insane. And also not my joke, which is probably why it's a good joke. He was a responsible boy with a responsible job, a job that had plenty of opportunity for advancement and the ability to have a truly lucrative and stable career where he's so inclined to pursue a life in banking and finance. But... Who's got time for any of that bit? To all appearances, that was who Ted Conrad was. But at only 19 years old in 1968, by my count, just a stupid kid, a stupid kid that had an intense summer romance. Not with a girl, but with a movie. The Thomas Crown Affair. Oh, that's a great movie. This must be the original one. Uh, I've only seen the remake with Piers Brosnan. And I just love that line from the movie. Where he's like, uh, dis- someone's describing Thomas Crown. And uh, they're like, He's. I'm butchering the line, but basically Thomas Crown is rich and he likes sailing, and they, he likes crash. He likes crashing his boat, that costs like millions of pounds because he likes the splash. And I'm like legend. It was a movie about a millionaire bank robber, and it was love at first sight. Conrad became obsessed, seeing the movie in theaters at least half a dozen times. When he started his job at the bank the following year, he would constantly brag to his friends about how easy it would be to take money from the bank. In fact, he went one step further and told them he intended to do so. Rule number two, don't tell people about your crimes. Oh, I like that Kevin's a fan. He's familiar with the rules. That is literally rule number two. I have an update on the uh, the notebook that I've been making, because people who are new well you're probably not interested in purchasing my merch already but uh it's been a bit of a saga getting a high quality notebook i was so disappointed with all the print on demand crap that's super expensive and rubbish um that i literally found someone to find like found a dude on this like freelance website called upwork to find me a factory in china who were making like this leather bound notebook with like a stamp that says don't uh definitely not my crimes on the front with the casual criminals logo customized and the front page the 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 first leaf of the 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 notebook has uh, the first 30 rules printed on it and number two is uh, don't tell people about your crimes Enough of that tangent, that notebook, it won't be ready soon. They're sending me the sample now, 
and if it's good i think i'm gonna order like 500 of them which is probably way too many uh, but they'll be available for sale soon probably cheaper than the original notebook from the company from the print on demand company and a million times better you're welcome world thank you you are a true christian our rule two applies even when you haven't committed your crimes yet while we don't yet live in a totalitarian state where someone could be arrested for potential future crimes who knows what tomorrow holds we're getting a little dark and i promise i'm in a light-hearted heist episode so let's get back on track the heist now that ted conrad has fallen in love with the idea of a bank heist and has secured a job at the bank all that was left over was to do was to complete the crime the thomas crown affair featured the robbery of a boston bank completed by four thieves and a getaway driver all orchestrated by thomas crown it's an elaborate plan in which none of the parties involved ever meet crown and they never even meet each other before the day of the heist oddly thomas crown does not spend the first 30 minutes of the film bragging to all his friends that he's going to do this but that's a movie not real life surely something so complicated and with so many people involved wouldn't work in real life would it no probably not ted conrad's plan was much more simple like as simple as a plan could possibly be i'm not sure whether he's a lucky moron or whether i undersold his rather quaint 135 iq but buckle your seat belts because it's time for a heist then unbuckle them because this is going to be an extremely smooth ride <laughs> <laughs> i like it it's like yeah shit in the movies is always super complicated but in real life it's like no 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 just walked into the bank asked for some money left and never did crimes again and just went on to have a new life it's like okay I, mental on friday the 11th of july 1969 the day after conrad's 20th birthday he went to his job in the bank vault as normal during his lunch break conrad walked to a liquor store a block away and purchased a bottle of canadian club whiskey which was of course both wrapped in a brown paper bag and also legal for a 20 year old american to do back then canadian club whiskey i bought a bottle of this because i'd been watching Mad Men, and i was like don draper is a man of style and taste i bet he drinks great whiskey so i bought a bottle of canadian club and it was rather cheap and i was like okay and then i tasted it and i was like i was wrong about don <laughs> this is horrible <laughs> and it's still in my liquor cabinet and i've literally fig finished every other bottle of liquor in there because i need to order more and uh the canadian club i'm just like mm -mm, mm -mm, i'm not gonna drink that it's not very good it's not a great whiskey even for the price but that was not meant to be a celebratory drink so it didn't matter glad kevin's on the same page on that one once the bank was clever is like reading my mind i'm quite impressed don't be creepy once the bank was closed he told his partner in the vault that it was okay to leave and did finish up himself and be along in a few minutes in typical american fashion his partner was happy to cut corners with his work no question asked and left conrad alone in the bank in the vault to stuff two hundred fifty thousand dollars into his bag leaving the bottle of whiskey in the vault <laughs> legends also kevin like ragged I, I i don't know if kevin's american i think he is I'm trying to remember pretty sure he is so that's okay he can say these things i don't want to be accused of being racist against americans he left the vault chatted with the security guard for a bit and walked out that two hundred fifteen thousand dollars is 1.7 million dollars in today's money and it's one of the largest bank robberies in cleveland's history but that was it this was the whole plan the bank had minimal security and he was the one to close the vault so he just shoved the money in the paper bag and walked out he did it on a friday because he knew that no one would notice the money was missing until they reopened on monday which gave him two and a half day head start the detectives weren't going to have to play a game of who done it ted conrad closed the vault on friday didn't show up for work on monday and the whiskey bottle that was supposed to be in the bag he walked out of the vault with was where the money would have been and yes he told all of his friends about it and probably anyone who would listen to him about how easy it was to rob a bank and that he was doing it so yes it was you have exactly two days teddy boy to so start running because they know exactly who they're looking for and the fbi does not f around although it seems like the fbi f around for 52 years as well as the marshals as well as america's most wanted the the television show which i assume we're referring to by tv screens so they kind of did f around didn't they fbi didn't you didn't you two days was enough though and when Tom Gret ted conrad walked out of that bank he vanished in a puff of smoke perhaps quite literally because what the 20 year old smoker didn't know at the time was that this habit would be the reason it'd finally be identified but he was a marlboro man maybe if it paid more attention to the advertisements he saw as a child he would have remembered that more doctors smoke camels than any other brand and he should and he would still be evading capture to this day 
Say it with me, Simon. The pastor is the worst. Yeah, cigarette advertising. Cigarette advertising is still a thing where I live. Like, I, I, it amazes me. I live in Prague in the Czech Republic. And uh, you don't see it on, like, bus stops and everything. But stores that sell tobacco, there's still adverts in the window being like, get new minty cigarettes. And you're like, how are minty cigarettes legal? And how is advertising minty cigarettes legal? <laughs> What's going on, government? Come on, ban that shit now. The hunt begins. On the 15th of July, 1969, the, I'm also curious how a cigarette's going to lead to his capture. That's kind of weird. Uh, on July 15th, 1960, unless he's going to get sick, oh, he's going to get lung cancer or something, isn't he? And he's going to go in for treatment and they're going to identify him with like blood or something. Or No, there's no blood. It's going to be something to do with him getting sick, right? On the 15th of July, 1969, the FBI was already in Cleveland investigating. This had been standard for bank robbery since 1933 when the FDIC started insuring banks, making all of this federal matter a federal matter. That's some leads too. When he first committed the heist, the handsome and popular Conrad had a girlfriend who he was already receiving letters who was already receiving letters from him. One letter showed that it had been mailed from the International Airport in Washington, D.C. Within a few days, she received another letter, this time postmarked from Inglewood, California, where Los Angeles Airport is located. Not to be confused with Anaheim, California, where Major League Baseball's Los Angeles Angels are located. Uh, why would I confuse it with that? I don't know. Are the two Inglewoods? I'm confused. I don't know Los Angeles. Although I've been to uh, Anaheim, California. It's where VidCon is! VidCon for you know non youtube people is this big youtube conference and it's it's fine like it's it's quite a laugh it's like the only time i really meet up with other people who do youtube stuff because i mean i have one friend here who does youtube stuff but he's the only one <laughs> i don't know anybody i mean i do on the internet but not in real life I guess when your city has 4 million people, there isn't room for anything those people actually want. In one of the letters to his girlfriend, Conrad wrote, I do want to write, though I only ask that you burn my envelopes so the authorities don't get the postmarks. It's unclear whether she didn't heed this warning or if the FBI was inter intercepting the mail first, but much to my surprise, it seems unlikely that she turned them over out of spite. I assume that she would have happily turned everything over to the authorities after he left with all the money, but without her. But there are recorded phone conversations between her and Conrad after the wire having started. He also lamented in one of his letters that he gave her up for a mere $250,000 and seemed hopeful that they would someday be reunited, but that was not to be. As for the investigation, there just wasn't enough there to pin down his location. It was early on in the investigation, but the leads were already starting to go cold. I feel like you could track that money. But I guess he's just going to bury it for a while, or just like launder it somehow, or just spend it in really small increments over time. Something like that. That's got to be kind of a way, I guess. I don't know, I'm not a bank robber. But also, I kind of feel like if you're giving up your whole life, like you're robbing a bank, and you know that it's like you're exiting the picture and starting a new life somewhere, you've already got that new life set up, and you know you can't have any part of your old life back. So he's probably just being a stupid 19-year-old writing to his girlfriend because he's like, I miss my girlfriend. But uh, I, he, he knew what was going on. Until October of that same year, that is. A retired couple from Ohio were vacationing in Hawaii when they noticed a young man who struck up a conversation with the husband. They talked for about 20 minutes, and the stranger invited the retired man inside for a drink. I'm not sure what the wife intended to do while they had that drink, but this was the 1960s, so I guess she probably didn't have a vote yet in whether or not the couple were swingers. And it was up to the men to sort out the details. The 1960s, man. I was just thinking Mad Men, it's like, no, we go for a drink, you can wait outside. <laughs> Fucking hell, the fast. It was then that the retired man casually mentioned being from Beechwood, Ohio. Suddenly, the young man had to go and rescinded the offer of the drink. When the couple returned home, they saw the picture of Ted Conrad in the newspaper, and they knew that this was the young stranger they'd met in Honolulu. By the time the FBI arrived there to investigate, Conrad was gone, and this time, there would be no leads. He had vanished without a trace. With no new leads, all they could do was build a profile of Conrad, what they called life pattern activities. They knew Conrad was left-handed, liked golf billiards, and was a car enthusiast, particularly sports cars. They even reached out to Steve McQueen, the actor who portrayed Thomas Crown, in case Conrad tried to contact him. Yes, I would say they are running out of ideas. <laughs> that is so random. Steve McQueen is like, FBI, I'm serious right now. I'm busy, and I'm a movie star. What, what am I going to do with this guy? 
go out for criminals with for drinks i'm steve mcqueen now just before we continue with today's video let me thank today's fantastic sponsors first up everybody is sheath what is sheath well it goes this way around actually so i can show you what's special about it it is men's underwear basically reinvented and you think how can you reinvent men's underwear what have you done what is so amazing about this well for one i don't know my problem is i hate briefs I hate them like the the smaller underwear which is super tight it brings everything in and i'm like why is this so compressed why is everything like this and then boxers my preference but also kind of loose you know it's also th there's nothing really in between until sheath came along and they've like we've solved this problem and uh, it's a little bit weird to describe bear with me but there are various pockets for various things gentlemen <laughs> there's a pocket for uh you know two things in here and then another thing goes through here and by thing i mean balls and dick yes that's right it just keeps everything separate and more comfortable just try it and it's just one of those things you won't regret this was actually invented by a u.s soldier who was in iraq iraq yeah it was iraq he was on his second tour in iraq and he was like it's really hot and nothing's working down there and it's very uncomfortable so he invented sheath and then everyone else is like i really want that and uh, it's just one of those things that you try and then you understand and then you're like okay i get it and if you're a woman listening to this you might think this is not for you and it's not but uh look if you've got a man in your life buy him one of these give them to him and uh then see what happens he'll be like this is a weird gift and about a couple of days later he'll be like you legend thank you <laughs> so uh go use the link below use my code criminalist and check out or you can just go to sheathunderwear.com forward slash criminalist and you'll get 20 percent off uh do your balls a favor indeed or the man in your life's balls fantastic again sheathunderwear.com slash criminalist or use the code criminalist for 20 percent off next up thank you so much to curiosity stream today's second sponsor brilliant stuff on curiosity stream curiosity stream is a subscription streaming service that offers thousands of documentaries and non-fiction titles from the world's best filmmakers including exclusive originals i love how they describe this netflix for nerds hulu for history buffs brilliant stuff and look you're listening to a true crime show and there's plenty of true crime stuff on there i actually dug out some recommendations for you guys let me just find those let me just bring that up what did we find what did we find oh okay i got three actually new scotland yard files detectives from scotland yard basically talking about how they caught notorious criminals that's a docu-series the interpol case which is a documentary all about how how interpol works which is like the international police or whatever i just saw that movie red notice with ryan reynolds that was all about interpol which i'm sure is completely unrealistic but it was fun but if you want to learn about how interpol actually works now they like internationally police the world clever naming right check that out and then finally who killed trudy adams which is kind of classic true crime docuseries investigative stuff if you like this show you're gonna like all three of those aren't you it seems pretty simple uh curiosity stream is available on many platforms there's a giant list here but look if you've got a screen you can watch this like your big smart tv your phone whatever it's going to be available um what else what else okay you can go to uh, curiositystream.com forward slash criminalist you'll get criminalist sorry curiositystream.com forward slash criminalist you get unlimited access to the world's top documentaries and non-fiction titles and right now use that code criminalist and you get it for how much $14.99 and you might be thinking is that per month simon that's about the same price as other streaming services and to that i'll tell you no no dear listener no dear viewer that is per year it makes it like a dollar something a month dollar 40 40 something something like that look it's insanely cheap 25 percent off with my code criminalist make it 14.99 a year i say cheap that makes it sound cheap but it's not it's just insanely good it's just an insanely good deal like i say link below use my code criminalist and now back to the show television star no ted conrad didn't get caught because he became a famous actor but that didn't stop him from making numerous television appearances i'm sure much to his disapproval conrad was featured on multiple episodes of america's most wanted as well as on unsolved mysteries unfortunately i can't find the episodes that featured him though i doubt they have anything to say that wasn't covered by the countless cleveland news stories about him still this was an important step to take for the investigators as before the television shows this nationwide manhunt hadn't actually received a lot of national coverage yeah because he's like in terms of people i want to get caught i mean yes it's bad that he stole money from a bank a faceless bank who is insured by a faceless government and i know he's stealing money from the taxpayer or whatever but it's also like how about how about fbi 
until you've got all of the child predators how about we just leave them alone i mean we don't want to say like don't say it publicly but just put way less effort on that and way more effort on the child predators i mean doesn't that seem fair <laughs> If you recall, the crime took place on the 10th of July 1969, and the FBI and US Marshals weren't involved in the case until July the 15th. While this was a huge sum of money to steal from a bank, and they knew this was going to be a nationwide search, it's kind of hard to get anyone to pay attention to something as trivial as that, when just five days later, on July the 20th, we landed on the f moon. <laughs> it turns out the Apollo mission completely eclipsed the heist coverage. There's no way to know if that was a consideration in Conrad's plan, but if it was, well, kudos. <laughs> we have to consider the history of America's most wanted, though. While ratings ultimately dipped and it's now off the air, it's hard to consider the show anything other than massively successful. Just four days after the first episode aired, they'd arrested one of the people featured on the show as a direct result. In fact, there are just under 1,100 episodes of America's Most Wanted and over 1,200 arrests that are directly attributed to the show. That's a lot of arrests, and unless I'm bad at maths, that doesn't add up. Unless they're arresting accomplices as well? Oh, no, 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 they could be arresting people falsely. <laughs> they're probably just arresting people who look like the guys on the TV show, right? If you're terrible at math, there we go, uh, it's more than one arrest per show. And Ted Conrad was featured on the show multiple times in addition to being on Unsolved Mysteries. I've seen some photos of him aged by police, and honestly, most of them are pretty good. Without the original footage, I can't say whether the photos I saw are the same ones they would have run on these shows, but if they were of similar quality, someone identifying him based on these images would absolutely have been reasonable. This only leaves one possibility as to how he was never turned in. Ted Conrad himself must have been the nicest guy and the best neighbor ever. He just seems like a really likable guy. And people are like, yo, Ted, I saw you on America's Most Wanted. He's like, yeah, I know you did. That mother has been chasing me around for years. Looks exactly like me. It's a nightmare. And they'll be like, hey, Teddy, see you at the barbecue. That's how it works. Seriously, no one saw the show and turned him in. Beyond growing a beard, he did little to change his appearance. I mean, he also got older, but that doesn't count because he, that was going to happen anyway. We'll talk about where and how he was found shortly, but I'll share a little personal insight with you. For the vast majority of my life, Ted Conrad lived about five minutes away from me. Oh, I remember! Kevin said he wanted to do this one because this guy was local to him. Oh, that's mad in the next town over. Even if he was a really great guy, some law-abiding citizen would have feel, felt obligated to turn him in, wouldn't they? Well, I don't trust him either, but he is my friend. The Dynamic Duo there's one part of the story that normally gets a lot of coverage, but I haven't touched on it at all yet, and that's because I just find it really, really sad. John K. Elliott was a deputy United States Marshal from 1969 until 1990 when he retired. He picked up the case immediately because he and Conrad were from the same part of town and he took it personally, very personally. He searched for Conrad for his entire career and even into retirement. His son, Pete Elliott, followed in his father's footsteps and took over the case when his father retired. That's a testament to just how long this case went on when two generations of the same family are trying to solve the same cold case. John never stopped searching all the way up until he died in 2020, 30 years after his retirement. But it's not just the fact that his father died without ever getting closure that makes this part of the story sad. No, it's because, as far as I can tell, they didn't really do anything to solve anything. Allegedly, in my personal opinion. Wait, so they just... <laughs> but they did! They spent a long time doing it, didn't they? Now I'm confused. The Confession Thomas Randell moved to Linville, Massachusetts in 1970. Very coincidentally for our story, this wasn't far from where the Thomas Crown Affair was filmed. He started working at Pembroke Country Club and eventually became manager. If you're not from the US, you'd probably know it as a golf club. Basically, it's a large area of gated property where rich people go to pay, play golf and exclude people. <laughs> Not long after arriving in the Boston area, Thomas met his future wife, who he married in 1982. It was around this time that he left his work at the country club and transitioned to a career in his second love, luxury automotive sales. This guy's... I, I like this. It's like, what are his passions? He loves golf and fast cars. So he works at a golf club, and then he works at a place selling fast cars. And he's just got loads of money in, like, a suitcase somewhere. Just to, like, make his life a little bit more cushy than it would otherwise be. I mean... It's like, I don't know, I would, would I turn this guy in? I honestly don't think I would. 
Is that bad? I'd just be like, nah, it's okay. Who cares? Why would I, why would I be a dick? <laughs> something, something, life pattern activities. U.S. Marshals, where are you? Just kidding, there's no reason Thomas Randell would have been on anyone's radar because he was a total sweetheart. Everyone said he was a fantastic guy, an absolute gentleman, just a treat to be around. If you're a wanted criminal, the only hope you could have of evading capture is to live a squeaky clean life, never breaking any laws. And that's the type of person Thomas Randell was. His friends and colleagues say he never even once tried to bend the rules at golf. This is striking because as far as I can tell, golf is about 20% skill and 80% cheating. Why do you think they keep score with pencils? But not Tom. He was the kind of person that everyone liked and no one would ever suspect could break the law. And even if they did suspect it, they still weren't going to drop a dime on him. Ultimately for Thomas, he had a nasty habit that was ready to catch up with him. In May of 2021, he lay in a hospital bed dying of lung cancer. I was right. He was 73 years old, or so his wife and daughter thought. It was here, at the end of his life, that he told them everything. His real name was Ted Conrad, and he was a wanted fugitive. He had robbed the bank where he worked back in 1969 and been living under a false identity ever since. I'd love to know more about false identities. Like, you just go somewhere new, they're not like, I don't know, all that you were told is important as a kid. Don't you have, like, you want to get a job? Well, I need to have, like, a record of employment. I need to have a former boss to call. I need to have, like, records of your education. When you get a new identity, does all of that come with it? Are you in, like, the system? How does that work? Oh, I guess this was, like, the ninth back in the day. So I imagine it was easier than today, where it's all, like, computers. And they're like, no, 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 I googled you. You don't have any history. You don't even have a Facebook page. You're a made-up person. Since the legal drinking age in America was 18 back then, I have no idea why the 20-year-old Conrad would have opted to make himself 22 instead of 18. Perhaps after throwing his life into chaos over a childlike obsession with a movie, he was in a hurry to grow up. I don't know. If I was young, I'd pretend to be old if I wanted to go somewhere and start a new life, because it's easier to get a job if you're 22 than if you're 18, because people are just going to assume the 22-year-old's more mature right? Marshal Pete Elliott was tipped off to the obituary of Thomas Randall, and he immediately noticed a number of similarities to Ted Conrad. They were both born in Denver, both attended New England College, were both born on July 10th, just two years apart. Both had a father named Edward and a mother with the much less common name of Ruthabeth, and both mothers had the same maiden name. That is, that is so many that is, it's him. They know it's him. It is unknown who alerted Elliot to the obituary, but I wouldn't be surprised if it was Conrad's wife after discovering her husband's true identity. She no doubt saw the myriad of news stories about him online and wanted to give the father and son investigative team the closure they deserved, unaware that it was too late for the father. Pete Elliot was able to use official documents for both Conrad and Randell to have the signatures analyzed and conclusively prove that they were the same person, and this wasn't some bizarre deathbed hoax. That'd be a pretty. <laughs> you gotta be a real to do that on your deathbed just to be like hey guess what and then people find out you were lying and it's like why did you do that why eluding capture so how did conrad change his identity and stay under the radar of law enforcement for so long. The FBI and the US Marshals had a lot of information on him in their investigation, and I mean a lot. There were 20 binders full of documents and reports on this one case, and they were not small binders either. They were taking this seriously. They had exhaustively searched every day they had from Ohio to Colorado to Washington, D.C. to Hawaii to Texas, but you'll note that Massachusetts was nowhere on the list. Even though it was only six months between Conrad leaving Ohio and arriving in Boston, it seems it was long enough for him to stop writing letters, making phone calls, and buying drinks for strangers. As for changing his identity, convincing fake documents, especially social security cards, are very difficult and expensive to come by. Well, the good news is he's got a lot of money, so if money's the issue, problem solved. And the guys who make those things are going to be like, they're not going to ask where you got that money from. They're just going to be like, cool, I take cash and cash. But what if he wanted to ensure his credibility by doing one better and getting a real social security card under a fake name? Wouldn't that be nearly impossible? Actually, it'd be. So wow, I'm glad we're learning something about how to get a fake identity. <laughs> Actually, it'd be super easy, barely an inconvenience. While these days Americans receive their social security number and card at birth, that's not so how it worked back in 1970. Back then, you had to go to the social security office and get it for yourself. So one day, Ted Conrad wa walked into the social security administration office in Boston and said, Hi, my name's Thomas Randell. Here's my fake date of birth. I'd like a social security number, please. Well, that's how you do it. Like I say, it's probably more difficult today because, what, they just said you get it at birth. So they're not going to buy that. They'll be like, I need a new one. <laughs> They'll be like, you don't get a new one. You have one. <laughs> right? That's how it works. 
and with that he was and with that he was able to get a driver's license and open a bank account all under a fake name all with 100 percent authentic government issued documents once again the past was the worst it does seem that it was ridiculously easy then in the past to just be able to go get a fake identity be like yeah yeah, yeah i'm that guy seems like you are mate here's a new passport there was still one more detail to not worry about. Ted Conrad and Tom Rendell had the same fingerprints. I say this is a detail not to worry about because once again, back in 1970, it was not common practice for employers at a bank to be fingerprinted the way it is today. By the time I was 20, I'd been fingerprinted at least twice and I never did anything wrong. Yeah, for sure. Like, I feel like plenty of countries now fingerprint you when you arrive. Um, I don't think I've ever been fingerprinted with, like, ink, other than, you know, for fun, like, as you know, playing as a kid. But I've definitely had that, like, scanning fingerprint done many, many times. One of them was my fault for taking a summer job at the U.S. Post Office, but one was done when I was in elementary school, to the entire school. Good old Teddy, though, had never been fingerprinted in his life, and Tom wasn't fingerprinted when he came into existence. Sure, the authorities had the whiskey bottle that he left in the vault in the day of his crime, but as long as Rendell never got a job or committed a crime that would require him to be fingerprinted, they would never have anything to match it to. Yeah, but even if you, if you get arrested, do they fingerprint you? Or do you have to be charged with a crime? I don't know. Because you could be arrested if you don't do anything. Or you could be arrested for, like, something I mean, I've never been arrested. But I imagine, like, that's more likely, right? And then you're going to get fingerprinted. Or if you travel, you're going to get fingerprinted. Right? So, what happened to all the money? Well, that part is the bit that remains unanswered, and the U.S. Marshals are still trying to figure it out. Perhaps he lost it early in a series of poor investments, or perhaps he moved to Linfield, where the average house currently costs $875,000. Really... Who can say? This part of the case remains unsolved, but fortunately, they aren't trying to go after his family's assets to recover what he stole. I don't think that's allowed. Your debts. I just made a video about this, actually, for my Today I Found Out channel, where we talked about what happens if you die in debt. And uh, generally, I believe the case in America was it doesn't pass to your relatives unless it's like medical debt or something when they were trying to keep you alive. Um, so they couldn't do that anyway, I don't think. Wrap up. So there you have it, the blueprints of the perfect crime. All you need to do is simply be born 70 years ago when national security was a joke, commit a simple crime with no accomplices, then live the rest of your life as a kind, upstanding citizen so as never to draw suspicion from anyone. Seems easy enough for anyone who isn't a condescending douchebag like me. It's like, yeah, that's the problem. I'd also, it wouldn't work for me also, because I'd be like, nah, I want to do like YouTube stuff. I liked that. That was fun. I liked having my face on camera all the time. <laughs> but now they'll be like, dude, you're that guy from America's Race Wanted. You <laughs> busted. Dismembered Appendix. Do you know how the Statue of, Del of Limitations works? Ted Conrad didn't, at least not at first. In an early letter to his girlfriend, he commented that the statute was seven years, so perhaps afterwards he could come back and they could fall in love. He then jokingly said that they were just six years and 358 days until he could come back. Luckily for Ted, he never did. The start, he had the numbers wrong, as the statute of limitation for bank robbery is five years for federal court and six years for the state of Ohio. That seems very low. I mean, I, the, in the UK, there's no statute of limitations. I mean, because it's all based on, like, I guess if it was a crime a really long time ago, like this, they would just choose not to prosecute because it's like, there's more important shit to do. But there's no statute of limitations on the books like there is in a lot of other countries. But five years for bank robbery? I don't know, that seems pretty short. You rob a bank, go to ground for like five years, and then you're like, I robbed a bank, baby. And they're like, nothing we can do about that. It's pretty crazy. Uh, that's not important, though. The important part is that this is how long the state or federal government has to bring these charges against you. If they know who you are, they can indict you and put a warrant out for your arrest. Once that has happened, the statute of limitations can't help you. If they... If they know you committed a crime, you can't outrun the law, unless you're just really, really nice, like Ted. Oh, okay. Wait, did they charge him? I guess so. Maybe. Who knows? But for those of you who got away with crimes without being indicted, be sure to get in the comments and share your stories. There'd be people down there like, yeah, baby, I robbed a bank back in the day. <laughs> don't do that. Like, even if it's past, just don't do that. Don't write down your crimes, even if it's past the statute of limitations. I don't know, just in case. Just in case, don't do that. I know it goes against the first rule of the casual criminalist, but if you escape the statute of limitations, then feel free to gloat. Just remember, there's no statute of limitations for murder, so keep those stories to yourself. Otherwise, I'll see you in the next episode. Good. I'm glad there's no statute of limitations for murder, because that's the biggie. Um, yeah, yeah, I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you're listening to this show, please do consider leaving it a review. If you're watching on YouTube, yeah, leave us a comment. 
like it subscribe why not and i'll see you next time